Okay. Wildlife. Smoky Hills Audubon Wildlife Sanctuary. Before I can get into all this, I need a time machine to take you all back in time so that you can realize um, what was going on when this started. And uh, so I put this together. Iron Eyes Cody, um, a second generation Italian, um, his message was running on television all the time and was voted by the Ad Council one of the 50 greatest advertisements of all time. So when you turned on TV, you saw the Indian crying with the trash being thrown at his feet. And then uh, John Duschendorf, D-E-U-T-S-C-H-E-N-D-O-R-F, comma, Jr., um, who later changed his name to John Denver. Um, the 40s, uh, uh, Elvis Presley, the 60s had the Beatles, and uh, the 70s had John Denver. And he was literally everywhere. He hosted The Tonight Show. He had four number one songs, three number one albums. You couldn't turn on your radio without hearing somebody talking about Rocky Mountain High. And uh, I just pointed this out, that this is the camera that most people carried with them. I put that in there for Scott's benefit because he's a photographer. And uh, we'll get to that just here in just a second. And the other thing was Earth Day had been conceived in 1970. Um, I think Ted Zerger's back here somewhere. <laughs> he was a hippie with long hair. And uh, before he became a math teacher. Um, so all that was going on. And it was in this climate of uh, John Denver and the Muppets and stuff and, and uh, the Earth Day and everything that out of all this was born this Smoke Hills Audubon. And now it'll be a brief history. Um, no fake news. Um, this is all sourced from the um, Audubon Society's um, one of a kind materials removed from the Audubon Library. So whoever took those is in trouble. The earliest beginnings of the uh, Audubon Society were in 1974. Smoky Hill. Smoky Hill Audubon Society, 1974. And it says here, this is volume one, number one of their newsletter. And uh, their meetings being held not in the usual place, but in, in a new place. And Ken Miller and George Tolan, local biology teachers, will explore possible locations and use of a uh, environmental study area. And uh, you can see here that um, they were getting ready for a Christmas bird count. Um, they were having a special meeting where everybody was supposed to bring their 10 favorite slides um, to the meeting. Um, Ken Baker was presenting a uh, program on attracting birds through proper landscaping, something that Doug um, would know all about. And uh, they've identified that they want to have a nature area for the uh, biology students to study um, what they called an outdoor classroom. And so from the very beginning, they had a specific goal. And that goal was uh, to put together a program where kids could uh, learn about nature. Um, George Tolan was a biology teacher. It says, with forceful simplicity, George demonstrated the potential value of an outdoor environmental study area. Ken Miller and Tolan then explained the history of their efforts, so apparently it had been going on for a while, um, to have a designated study area set aside near each of the two high schools. And they were going to talk to the uh, administration, and they had the Bicentennial Commission um, was behind it, and uh, all of these groups were working together to come up with this. So their 
focus for the at the beginning were educational opportunities. They were talking about riverbank development, just as we are today. Um, they wanted to establish an Audubon library. Keep in mind, no internet. You know, you, the only way you could find out anything was you had to have a book to read. And so they wanted to put together an Audubon library. They um, had the Audubon film series. Remember, back then, you didn't have the Discovery Channel, you didn't have the Animal Planet, all you had was CBS, NBC, ABC, and that was it. Um, so, people wanting to know about the environment and stuff um, would come to the Smoky Hill Audubon meetings. They dove right into legislative issues, and of course they kept track of bird sightings. And this is a list of the uh, programs they had lined up and uh, the ecological setting of the Plains Indian that would be appropriate for today. Audubon tour through East Africa, Jim Griggs could give that today. Alternate energy sources by Wes Jackson. Um, all we know about the house sparrow, that, all that stuff could be exactly what we're doing just today. Um, the library um, got going pretty good, but, and I noticed this top item here. Um, we lost the start of our Smoky Hills Audubon Society Library in the fire at the land. So, so they, had, they got started, but then it all burned up in a fire. And the other thing um, that was interest here, this is the first mention under pond managers. It says the S the SHAS has been given the opportunity to manage the little pond near I-135. Not the fishing lake, but the little pond near the police shooting range. <laughs> A committee is now being formed to take, make plans for the care of this pond. And we're hoping to plant and encourage habits that will of course invite our feathered friends. Um, if you want to identify with that project, talk to Ann Porter. So, um, 1976, they were just starting. She lives well, in Florida now, Mark. Oh, she does? She does, yeah. Okay, I did not know that. Um, go forward to July 77, arrangements for the pond are nearing an end and they, an agreement has been returned from the state. We are all eager to develop this pond into a nature area to educate our young people. All ideas and suggestions are welcome. So what they set out as a goal, um, they were working towards. In 78, we see the first reference to the Smoky Hills Wildlife Sanctuary. Um, ben Brown from the Division of Biology is uh, using it for wildlife techniques. In October 78, they had their very first work day. About a dozen people showing up, setting poles, mowing and picking up and building a blind for bird watching. Um, by March of 79, uh, spring work was starting at the sanctuary. Um, by April, they were having their first work day. Um, come out and do some birding, then stay in plant trees and shrubs. Contact Steve Burr, pond chairman. This is the first mention of Steve Burr, and Steve Burr continued on as the pond manager um, until Harold took over, and uh, unfortunately we lost Steve Burr, what was it, about six months ago? Um, he died from Parkinson's. Um, the weekly bird surveys continue, and the monthly sanctuary reports list all the species that are documented at the pond. Um, a little digression here. When you um, did things back then, you only had two choices. You could type it or you could type it in all caps. <laughs> and then you'd run out of uh, choices. And, uh, but you could always handwrite on the stencil. And the Land Institute and the uh, League of Women Voters and the Smoky Hills Audubon were all sharing the same mimeograph machine. And this is the first record I find of an annual summer picnic. 
in February 1980, a budget was submitted to the Board of Directors for expenditures at the sanctuary for insurance supplies for bird banding, signs, fencing, and biological surveys. Income from the pond expenses have been available in the past from the sale of baled hay taken from the 35 acres of brown grass. This is the 35 acres of brown grass that um, Dan has been working hard to get rid of. Um, <laughs> nearly half the sanctuary in 1980 was brown grass. Um, they were actually talking about fertilizing the brown grass to make it grow better. Um, in 1981, they um, scattered acorns and walnuts, strung cable, and removed the underwater bird line. It wasn't meant to be underwater. Apparently, they put the bird blind next to the pond, and then when they had a rainy year, the bird blind became an underwater bird blind. <laughs> By 1982, they were six years into the project. Um, Natural Areas Chairman Steve Burr and his committee will have enough projects to keep us busy, but have promised to go easy on the leg irons, bull whips, and guard dogs this year. <laughs> Bring appropriate tools, shovels and buckets, your lunch, beverages, birding gear, and expect to have a good time. We'll drill holes and fence posts, build fence, string cable, plant trees and shrubs, and perhaps, perhaps, native grasses and Maximilian sunflowers. The pond needs your help. Nineteen eighty-five. Um, I mentioned this because this is the very first time I personally ever came to a Smoky Hills Audubon meeting. Mm -hmm. It was the uh, 200th anniversary of James Audubon, his birthday, I should say. They were serving birthday cake, and they had a live eagle, and it was held in room 201, which is the big room as you come in over here on the west. And uh, you know, life is a circle, and who would have thought about the eagle flap its wings um, that in 2017, that I would be uh, given a talk at an Audubon meeting. I never would have thought of it. Um, by 1997, um, the sanctuary had become known as the Pond, and uh, Harold Lear had been taking care of it. Um, I can't read any of that from here, so I'll skip all that, which is to your benefit. Um, but down here, there's a quote from Marge Streckfuss that says um, that all this work has been done to create a sanctuary principally for the wildlife. You know, it's, it's okay if you come out here, call and get permission first, but primarily the focus of the group at that time was that um, this should be a sanctuary um, for animals. Then along comes Doug Ruddy. <laughs> Doug, Doug opened up, what was the name of the store, Doug? Wild Bird Crossing. Yeah. The Wild Bird Crossing. Crossing. And uh, he sold everybody in town a pair of binoculars. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, said if you just throw bird seed out on your driveway, the birds will show up. And he got the whole town invited to uh, uh, take bird walks and stuff and really got this movement of uh, everybody should be involved with birds. And as a result, um, the sanctuary um, came about in more of a public um, venue. And uh, those of you who didn't know Harold Laird would have enjoyed him. Um, Harold was a uh, scoutmaster, and he took on the wildlife sanctuary from Steve Burr and uh, really enjoyed taking people out there and showing them around. And he knew the names of every plant, every tree, 
and uh, he loved to open up the bird houses and show you the nests and all that kind of stuff and just really enjoyed it. And in 2011, Judy Collins presented Harold with a certificate for his years of service um, because he had really been a driving force. And he loved to come up with games. Um, this one involved throwing tennis balls that were held together with rope into a bucket. And uh, here's Marge um, visiting with Doug and my wife. And uh, there's Paul Willis yes, yes, and uh, his I, wife. And, I didn't recognize him. Yeah. <laughs> He's that handsome. <laughs> But all this effort um, turned into something uh, worthwhile. And uh, wow. Harold um, <laughs> constructed this uh, dragon whose head had been chopped off <laughs> and uh, loves showing that to the kids. Mm -hmm. So what was the result of all this? Wow. The education dream turned out to be a, a wonderful place. The brome grass turned into tall, uh, big blue stem, Indian grass, um, goldenrod, wildflowers everywhere. The pond is, is a wonderful thing. Uh, sneezeweed, uh, bluebirds feeding their young, frogs. You don't go to a pond very often in the country anymore that's got frogs. These are pictures taken by uh, Audubon members, wow. the Canada geese. I hope for a better picture. This is, uh, what's that bird? Uh, King Kingfisher. Kingfisher. Kingfisher, and he's got a fish stuck on his beak. <laughs> yes. It's a wonderful picture. I wish I would have had a higher resolution picture. <laughs> The, uh, all that effort that people put into making little walking bridges and stringing cable and putting up signposts and markers, and it all uh, came to fruition and uh, turned out a really nice place. And uh, Doug continues to go out there and plant seeds and distribute seeds and stuff. and. Uh, this is probably the largest group of people. That's the Salina Hiking Club that I've ever seen out at the uh, sanctuary. What kind of butterfly was that? Uh, that was a morning, morning cloak. cloak. Morning cloak? Yes. Is it a morning? Pretty rare. I hardly ever see them. Right? You don't see them very often um, out in the open like that. And that one was on a blue spruce tree there by the shed. And the work, of course, at the sanctuary is never done. Here they are uh, cutting trees. I believe this is a group from uh, uh, West Star. And then I wanted you to meet our board. Some of these board members are here at the meeting. Uh, but these are our board members. They're not a scary group of people. Um, they're pretty nice folks. And uh, here we are getting together for a couple of board meetings. And uh, if you noticed in the uh, newsletter, I wrote a little article in there about why um, you should join the, uh, the board of directors and gave a half dozen good reasons to do it. And I just wanted to let you know that these people are not scary. And uh, if there's anybody here that would like to take part in Smoky Hills Audubon, uh, please contact me about being on the board because then, as board members, you can determine what we're doing. And so if you want to bring a skunk in for a meeting <laughs> or um, plan some activities. And I put this picture in also because we used to eat meat at the uh, Carver Center. And you can see there weren't very many people. I mean, usually you have 10 or 12 people at a meeting. And uh, we've grown. Now we're meeting at Kansas Wesleyan, and there are much larger groups of people. That much lady more there that is with that skunk there, that was my mother-in-law who recently passed away oh, September, really? September 11th. Oh. She was paralyzed on her left side, and she enjoyed coming to the Audubon She was meetings. always at the Audubon meetings yeah. at the Carver's. Uh, Dora, Dora Ross. Oh. She's wonderful. And then a shameless plug for Discover Salina. 
um, discover Salina naturally. The people that started this uh, group, uh, George Tolan and Ken Miller, the biology teachers, I think they would have been uh, proud of what we were doing to try and get kids to be outside and enjoying nature. Um, Nick Fent, um, who went on to be a famous uh, geologist, uh, Steve Burr, who worked on the sanctuary for so many years, uh, Harold Lear and Virginia Lear, um, Ivy Marsh, um, Joyce Fent, um, Bob Highgate recently <coughs> passed away. These are all people that, that worked so hard for uh, the Smoky Hill Audubon Society. And I asked um, Carrie Carpenter, she's uh, Ivy Marsh's daughter, um, if she had any early memories. And she said, you know, I was only 13 and I was interested in boys. <laughs> but my, my uh, parents, she said, were a part of this group. And she said, uh, what a wonderful, wonderful group of people that made a really big difference in the world. And uh, they've, everybody that was involved at the beginning went on to do something and make it really special. And if they wouldn't have worked so hard on the uh, sanctuary, we wouldn't have this place where a person could just go and uh, get away from the hectic uh, schedule of the day and, and just enjoy nature. And uh, that's what I enjoy it for. And. Uh, it makes me think what the next 40 years bring because we've accomplished so much. It's a great photo. Yeah. And that's all I got. What kind of a dragon? Well, oh, I knew you were going to ask and I was going to look it up. When I posted that on Facebook, I, I, uh, Don't see I, many I put the name like of it. But, no, you know, yeah. it's, right. You're a good photographer, Mark. Excellent. Thank you. Dragonflies are kind of fun to take pictures of